they had a sponsor on their their platform called Nightingale. And this sponsor had done, I want to say, one or two deals before this all happened on the, on the Cloud uh, Street platform had been successful. Then they raised money on this Miami deal, which was like a Miami office property. And then they raised another one, which was, uh, I think it was maybe New York or basically both office deals. And um, it then came out that there was fraud, a lot of fraud, um, many, many millions of dollars of fraud. It was a, a big black eye for CrowdStreet, especially for these investors who were under the false understanding that their money was protected because what CrowdStreet did was they did not actually check. Like basically, you would think that they would put the money in escrow. You would think they would gather all this money, put it into escrow, and then once the, the purchase is ready to go, release it to the sponsor. But that's not what they did. They basically said, as soon as we get $1 million in, let's send it to the sponsor. And then the sponsor said, great, I'm going to stick that into this bank account. And here's another $2 million. Oh, awesome. I'm going to send it to this bank account. And um, so there was a disconnect between what CrowdStreet was doing and, and, and you know, probably within the law, they were allowed to, to do what they, what they did versus what investors believed that they were doing and the protections that they believed was there. Hi, Adam Gower here, founder of GowerCrowd.com and host of the Real Estate Reality Show that you can find on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash GowerCrowd and on podcasts everywhere. My guest today is an old friend, Ian Ippolito. Now, Ian was one of the first people that I discovered had discovered real estate crowdfunding when I was doing my initial work on the industry a long time ago, probably around 2014, almost 10 years ago, uh, that uh, I came across Ian. And Ian has been tracking the real estate crowdfunding industry since then. His perspective is through the lens in part of the crowdfunding websites. He has uh, a, a newsletter that he puts out or puts out articles uh, about the industry once in a while and communicates with investors and sponsors on a regular basis. The other thing that's interesting about Ian is that, unlike me, he likes to share or is willing to share his uh, his investment it details about how he invests in alternatives, always providing the proviso that he's not a uh, an advisor, et cetera, et cetera. But he does share that. And he's going to share some of those insights with you today as well. He talks about what he's seeing in the world of real estate, crowdfunding, some of the recent events with some of the major platforms, Peer Street and Real Crowd and Realty Shares and Crowd Street, of course, and discusses the implications, what he's seeing in the market and how he sees the market evolving in the next few months and years. If you are not already subscribed to the Gower Crowd newsletter, do please go ahead to gowercrowd.com and uh, you, you will f check out more information on Ian uh, on the podcast page for today's episode. And while you're there, go to uh, click the uh, the subscribe button and uh, sign up for our newsletter. We have uh, I put a list of uh, all of some of the uh, people that are subscribed, not the people, but the companies they work for uh, who are subscribed to the newsletter. It's a very impressive list. Actually, it surprised me. Uh, when I built the list, uh, who exactly is reading our newsletter. Go ahead there anyway, gowcrowd.com and uh, hit the subscribe button. You'll get our newsletter. It comes out once a week. It's totally free and you can always unsubscribe. All right, let's get going with real estate crowdfunding expert and investor Ian Ippolito. So Ian, it's super good to see you. You were, Same. as you as you well know, and thank you so much. This was a long time ago. You were featured in my book, Leaders of the Crowd. Yes. And I interviewed people who were the uh, original, uh, uh, what would you call it? The the leaders who, uh, up, I want to say up took, it's the wrong word, but who adopted crowdfunding and took an interest in real estate crowdfunding at that time. And you asked me just now, before we started, what do you want to talk about? Well, this is what I want to talk about. This is the first time since the beginning of real estate crowdfunding that there has been a deep recession in real estate. Yeah. OMG. Yeah. What are you seeing, Ian? What's going on in the world? I mean, you and I have been predicting this for a while. Yeah. What's been going on? What are you seeing in the market? Tell me. 
Yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. you and I have, have been thought of thinking about this for a long time. Crowdfunding and, and real estate in general has been doing really well for many, 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 many years, but it was untested with a, a downturn. So, you know, first we, we kind of had kind of like two things that went on. So, so we had COVID, of course, which shut everything down. And then a lot of stuff came back actually rather quickly. So, you know, there was a lot of stimulus. There was a lot of things that were helping people, multifamily, you know, th there was some stress initially, but it actually came back very quickly. But then it was the the secondary effects, which really started hitting people. So it's like, so you had that first blast, you could call it, or first stress, and then a lot of people pop back. And then, then you have, oh, okay, well, you know, China is, you know, they seem to be slowing down over there. We've got inflation all of a sudden. Now that becomes a problem. Um, you had the, the war in Ukraine, which is now all of a sudden driving up food prices, increasing inflation. So all this stuff causing a very different environment than we've been in the last couple decades. And now all of a sudden, inflation is going up. It's a big problem. So the Federal Reserve raises rates. And of course, once they raise rates, all these real estate deals that have uh, non-fixed rate or flexible uh, uh, financing, all of a sudden their rates go up. And when that goes up, now all of a sudden expenses are going up and rents, you know, in general are not going up that fast. They, they, they were going up very well last couple of years, you know, extremely high, probably record setting high, but nothing is going up that fast. So you've got, so, so there was that. And then on top of that, you've got a change in the way people are like working because it used to be everyone would go to the office and all on top of that. Now it's like people realized after COVID, well, you know, you don't have to go into the office to work, actually. You can be productive at home. So a lot of these companies are not uh, renewing their leases or they're downsizing their office leases. So so the first stress, the major stress is really that I'm seeing is in office. You know, it's in office. It's just it's not in good shape right now because there just isn't as much demand as there was before. So a lot of these office deals, um, some of them are, are, are in trouble. Um but even on the multifamily side where, you know, that, there isn't that issue, but there still is, you know, all the other issues. You've got inflation. You've got certain types of people who, who've had difficulty, you know, keeping their jobs. Other types have been fine. But, you know, those huge rent raises that were going on every single year have stopped and really slowed down into like almost nothing now. And some of these pro formas that were based on, you know, rent, rents just going up and up and up and up. All of a sudden, they're like, you know what? Our, our interest rate just went up. Our loans are more. We need, we're going to default on our loan unless we can call more capital. So investors, you need to put in some more money, basically, or, or, or you're going to lose everything. So there are some of these deals and not all of them because not all did, you know, the, the, some did fixed financing, so they don't have to worry about it. Others had more uh, conservative pro formas and they weren't counting on that in order to perform. But there definitely have been quite a few uh, of those where either they're having problems or like they're like, hey, we, we need more money or, or we're going to go under. Now, what we have to talk about is the lens through which you see this world. Right. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's, there's probably just one guy out there who doesn't know you. So for the benefits of that person, mm -hmm. You've invested in a lot of deals, haven't you? And then just tell me your history of, of what you've been investing in and, and, and what the trends have been over the last few years uh, okay. and, uh, and kind of talk oh. about what, what you were seeing and, and how what you just described okay. uh, is uh, how, that, how your investing experience has informed what you just described. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So I, I guess uh, to, to back up, just kind of say like, who, who is this guy anyway? Um, it's like, <laughs> so, so basically way back when, you know, so say way back when, say like about 2012, 13, I exited as an entrepreneur for a tech company and I realized I was gonna become a full-time investor. And it's like, that was my new job. Mm -hmm. And so I took a lot of time to like figure out what I was going to do. And I didn't want to go into the traditional, you know, just put this X amount in stocks and X in bonds and you're done. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. So I invested a lot in, and I, I read about how real estate, a lot of people had made quite a, quite a lot of money and fortunes in real estate over, over many years. I wanted to have real estate in my portfolio. At that time, real estate crowdfunding had just become a thing. So I spent a lot of time looking at all the different real estate crowdfunding platforms and you know what was available and, and kind of learning about it and figuring out what I wanted to do. So yeah, I ended up investing in, you know, over time, now I'm a, I'm a kind of a picky investor. You know, there, there are, there, 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 there are many months there would be like hundreds of deals coming out, you know, and it's like, well, which one? I did not, I was not one of those people that some people are like, 
just put a small amount into every single thing that comes by. And, you know, I, I would more put larger amounts into a very small number. So that's just the way I do it. Everyone's different. And so, uh, you know, at the end of the year, I might put my money into like four or five, even though I'm looking at all of these investments, I'm still looking as they come in. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my personal strategy. And uh, yeah, I built up uh, a portfolio of many different as alternative assets that I like. Mm -hmm. I've got some multifamily sponsors that I like, you know, I've got, and I've got, you know, and, and there's so many asset classes related to real estate, you know, there's self-storage, there's mobile home parks, you know, there's all these things that are not quite traditional. There's office, thankfully, I, for me anyway, I stayed out of that. Um, there, there's also, then there's things completely unrelated to that that are like, you know, music royalties, there's life insurance settlements, there's all these other alternative investments that, that generate income. I'm interested in all of them because ultimately, you know, I, I want to see income. So um, yeah, I've, I've invested in, in quite a few. And oh, go ahead. I think it's you. you can say well, it. I was, yes, I, I could just a sharp intake of breath ahead of posing a question. You're quite right. Thank you for reading that. Uh, <laughs> so what about, uh, so you've, you've been investing in multifamily. Let's kind of focus on that a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I, especially as you've not been investing in uh, in office. Yes. So what do you, What? Uh, and I know that you do in your uh, in your review, uh, you do uh, share there's some intimate details of your portfolio. It's very interesting. Right, right, so right. Are, tell me what you've been doing in multifamily. What are you seeing? And uh, how, how are the multifamily investments you're in performing? Are you seeing capital calls? Are you seeing distribution stop? What, what's going on? Uh, well, with I, I, I'm fortunate, you know, so so maybe I back up to explain it. So like every investor is different. Every investor has a different way of doing things. My particular way is I want sponsors that have, at least one full real estate cycle. So they've experienced a downturn and have lost little to no money. That's really what I, one of my main things I want to see. And I want to see fixed rate debt. So I don't like floating rate debt. And I want to see low uh, leverage, which means lower returns, but or at least lower projected returns. But, uh, you know, it, 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 they hold up well, better in a, in a downturn. So for me personally, you know, I, the deals in I'm in are not seeing, you know, capital calls. So I, I'm fortunate, you know, they're they're conservatively structured so that I mean they're no nothing is infinitely, you know, unbreakable. So if things were to get bad enough, they could still come under stress. I've had, you know, like for example, I, I invest in uh, one sponsor called MG, for example. I have in a ton of their deals. And, you know, some of their deals are so old, they've just appreciated in value so much. They're just like, you know, and right and, and rents went up for so long. They're just in fantastic shape. Some of the more recent deals have, you know, were in this more challenging environment. And I think maybe one or two of them are not performing, you know, as they originally projected, but most of them are, even the new ones. So I'm pretty happy, you know, investing in those kind of sponsors where so far they're, they're not coming under stress. Ian, I mean, you actually just touched on something that is uh, profoundly insightful, but usually an insight that people only learn or appreciate once they've been through a downturn and that mm -hmm. is that you have invested with sponsors who have been through a downturn and who take on lower leveraged with fixed rate debt how did you figure that out without having invested with somebody who took higher debt uh on 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 uh on, on uh variable rate uh, terms mm -hmm. well, and lost you... how did you do that without <laughs> losing money we all need to money. learn that lesson. Well, you know, I I I, I got really lucky on one invest. My very very first investment was even before crowdfunding, a mm -hmm. real estate investment where I invested in a fund, and it ended up not losing money, but it very easily could have lost all of it. They got really lucky, uh -huh. and it was investing in uh, residential housing just before the Great Recession hit. So it was a lousy, lousy investment. They they ended up pivoting to multifamily, and it took like ten years to come back the money instead of like three years. Right, so. I ended up breaking even, but, you know, not really if I can count the cost of money and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, I saw, I was like, wow, things can really go off the rails. And so I just, you know, thought about, you know, what, what are the things that uh, I, I would not be comfortable with? And it's, and, and, you know, honestly, the sponsors that have been around a long time, they know these things already. So they're all kind of structured very similarly, you know, and, and they're not, they're usually not like loading up on the highest leverage and they're usually not doing a fixed rate debt where they're like so close where something that could go wrong could just throw the whole thing off because they want to maintain their 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 track records and their history too so they can continue to draw in money right so, and that was the other thing that you said ian as well is that you have quote accepted lower returns 
yeah. by having more conservative. But it's more than that, isn't it? You've been protecting your principle. Yes. It's not just about, you know, a quick buck, is it? It's more about long term. That is exactly it, because it's like in the short term, when times are good, I can look at, you know, oh, wow, I could have doubled my money there. I could have tripled it there. But you know what? One loss wipes out like a whole bunch of those, those awesome, awesome gains. Mm. So, yeah. So to me, it's much more important to preserve the principle. I'm much more concerned about making sure the principle is safe rather than the return on the investment. And then I figure the return on the investment takes care of itself over time. As long as it's as long as I'm with good sponsors over time. So yeah, during during a during a when times are good, it's like I'm on the road and I'm seeing all these other cars passing me much faster. I'm like, wow, you know, and, and I'm just sitting here puttering along. And uh, but then you know you come to a downturn, and all of a sudden you look on the side of the road and you see all these pileups next to you, and you're like, <laughs> okay, well that's it. So bad. I mean, essentially, you've resisted the fear of missing out. I mean, this is one of the biggest challenges, isn't it? For mm -hmm. I was just talking about real estate crowdfunding specifically. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest challenges is this. I think of it as the shiny object syndrome as well. Look at that super high IRR, uh, yes. and uh, yeah, I'm gonna double my money in two years. Ooh, let me go after that. There's not much more thinking. So. You did learn from experience, which I kind yes. of think, I mean, I kind of figured I, because it's very, it's one of those things, you know, with my kids, my, I, you know, I, I, my wife said, don't run with a knife or don't uh, play with glass or whatever. You don't really know what that means until you actually do cut yourself. Yes. And then you realize. And so most of the lessons do come out of going through a downturn. So mm -hmm. having learned from experience and also mm -hmm. being exposed as you are to so many accredited investors and having those kinds of conversations. Um, what are you seeing in the accredited investor world? Uh, uh, what kind of experiences are, are you hearing from investors that are, are kind of new to real estate crowdfunding? Who, who haven't been through the experience and have jumped at these opportunities? Oh, oh maybe who did jump in. Well, I mean, yes. yeah, it's like, they're, unfortunately, you know, um, it is really difficult when you don't know really what, what to look for and what not to look for. You do look at the return and you look at the story that's being told. And if you like the story that's being told, you don't really know how to investigate. You don't know how to like go onto Google Maps and look at the neighborhood. You don't know how to dig into the pro forma. So a lot of these people, investors, you know, sadly, you know, there's a lot of deals that they regret and you know and now either they have to come up with more capital which no one likes to do because no one typically budgets for that sort of thing or you know in some cases you know th things have actually gone south so um you know it is an expensive lesson to learn but like you said it's unfortunately probably a lesson that you have to learn mm. mm -hmm. right now the core of your uh I won't say reputation. It's, it's kind of rude to say that, but the core of your visibility expertise, I should say, core <laughs> of your expertise, uh, was built on creating uh, a kind of clearinghouse for understanding all the different crowdfunding platforms. OMG! I was fascinated when I saw that. You're like the first person that popped up when I was writing my book. Oh, this guy's <laughs> like really on top of it here. Cool. And I saw that you put out. Uh, I'm pretty sure I got an email from you not just long, so long ago mm -hmm. uh, that you just put out your latest list of the top crowdfunding platforms, the top 100. Well, wait a minute, Ian. Yeah. When I think of crowdfunding platforms, I can think of today, I don't know, three. <laughs> so when you talk about crowdfunding, what do you, are there really 100 crowdfunding <laughs> platforms like marketplaces? Or are you talking about sponsors who are crowdfunding? Like what, just yeah. help me understand that. I mean, scarily enough, there, there actually are 100. Most of them are not with us anymore. A lot of them have gone right. by the wayside. And then there's plenty of new ones that have been popping up now here in this recession, trying to like make a name for themselves. But yeah, these are not uh, deals. These are actually platforms. So marketplaces, right? Yes, marketplaces actually. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's been a lot of turnover. And yeah, and, you, and I'm, I'm totally with you. You're like, you can think about like maybe three where there's at least enough deal flow where a person would consider going to them. And uh, other than these new ones, you know, that, that, that is the situation today. That, that's what happened after, the, after this downturn. And there were a number of things that happened, you know, um, VC funding dried up for a lot of these guys. So, and that happened a couple of years, even before the recession hit. A lot of them had trouble raising money. They had to shut down, had to downsize, you know, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's definitely shrunk a lot. 
Right. Well, the first one that went down was uh, realty shares. And that was while there was this uh, massive uh, bull market as well. And yes, that was right. that was driven by VC capital, wasn't it? They, they just mm-hmm. wanted them to grow mm-hmm. too quickly. And you come out of the tech world. So what just going back to realty shares, which is a little okay. bit of old news these days. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you seeing similar kinds of issues uh, that occurred with realty shares to other platforms? today i mean you could definitely argue the same thing happened to peer street so that's one that relatively went into chapter 11 and um they did loans instead of mostly equity but same thing they were venture funded and then if you look at their documents about when they shut down what happens like i want to say something like 50 percent of their loans were in default so these were like really not good loans you know they were they were you know i'll call them bad loans so um and there was so much pressure, on, in my opinion. In my opinion, there was a lot of pressure on them to continue to underwrite because they'd taken all this VC money, even when the loans themselves were maybe not doing super great, but they made money on originating it and bringing in new investors. So they had to, they had to run that circle and they were on that treadmill. And uh, in the end, it was not sustainable for them. So yeah, I think it, uh, it, definitely is, it, it definitely happens in this space. You can try to go way too quickly and it can implode. Right. So Peter, it was like uh, the tail wagging the dog. The same with uh, realty shares. The idea that the capital that had invested in the company was pushing it to unrealistic performance KPIs, right? Key performance. Yes, KPIs. that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then real crowd. Uh, again, I, 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 I hope you don't mind me asking specifics okay. about these uh, websites. Just tell me if you do, by the way, and I'll shut up and ask something okay, else. Okay, no problem. Uh, but real crowd. So real yeah. crowd sold to uh, Infinity or somehow was absorbed by Infinity. Really? What do you know about what happened to real crowd? That was Adam Hooper's shot, wasn't it? It was Adam Hooper. You know, they didn't talk too much about it. You know, it's like in, they kind of, in, in their in their official marketing, it's like, hey, great news. We've been acquired by this other company. So if you look at just that, everything looks you know fine. But obviously, no company wants to shut down. So, um, you know, from my point of view, just from looking at the investors, they the quality of the due diligence on the site really took a hit over the last couple of years. It was like they were kind of known for having like good due diligence. You could go in there and you could see the track record of the sponsor and you could see all these things. And then slowly the deal started coming out and now they're not showing all the information. And, you know, someone that's interested would really have to dig. And for a lot of people, it's like, why would I even bother when I'm you know, flooded with all these other ones? And so I think, you know, for a certain type of investor that actually really looks at the deals, and, you know, I can definitely talk about from my, my own point of view, you know, I, I it really turned me off on their deals. And I felt I didn't have to, I shouldn't be my responsibility to kind of dig into this basic stuff and ask them a whole bunch of questions. Like it should be there. So they had that, you know, they had the issue where there was a, a fraudulent sponsor that took a lot of money and it wasn't just them. It was also on crowd street, but you know, the way that they dealt with it um, where they were informed about it and, you know, kind of took the position. It's not really our fault. We're not going to jump into it. Uh, where from my point of view, there are obvious red flag signs of fraud from, in my opinion. So I think they took a, a hit to their reputation by choosing to go that route rather than being more aggressive and just saying, hey, look, you know, we agree there's like there's signs of fraud here and we're not going to put this on our platform. But that's hard. It's hard for a, for a platform to do because they're making their money and they're I'm sure they're like, oh, just, let's just look the other way and hopefully nothing will go wrong. And uh, but it didn't. It's, inter- it's interesting set up because this was one of the things I think you and I talked about in the year dot. Yes. Right, right after crowdfunding, uh, the, you know, the Jobs Act was passed. So I don't know when we first met, th- 2013 or 14. Mm-hmm was that this idea that, okay, now it used to be that you would establish a relationship with a sponsor, you'd go out and then you would, you would, you would get to learn who they were and whether or not they were credible directly. But yes. now you've got these intermediary platforms and the mm-hmm. idea of a marketplace, and this is certainly something that all of the usual marketplaces and the ones that come to mind are things like Yelp, or Craigslist or whatever, right? Where you go online and it's still buyer beware. They make no mm-hmm. no recommendations. So the idea that platforms were making, well, again, I've got to be careful what I say. They weren't making recommendations, but they were conducting due diligence. In a way, added a different layer of responsibility to the investor because now you don't just have to understand the sponsor and who they are. You've also got to understand the credibility of the platform, don't you? That's and, yes. and so is that something that you 
is important to you as an investor is the is the uh, is the is the integrity of the platform itself and in what way yeah. the integrity and the structure because they're they're set up in different ways some of them would be just like well you know we're going to charge a fee to the sponsor you're never going to see us again and you're just going to connect you directly to them other ones are like well we're going to be charging you a certain percentage every year and we're going to be a go between and and so then it's like really important to know who you're going to be basically into this investment for for the rest of its lifetime um and yeah um you know on one hand legally they do not have any responsibility for what is going on in the platform although they have some they have to perform certain duties but not a lot on the other hand when they market they're all about yeah we, we do so much due diligence and you know so few people are able to get on listen on the platform so they give the impression that a person can can rely on them so there is a disconnect there and i think many investors i mean i I mean, I, if you know about the, the recent Crowd Street, uh, yeah, let's talk about that in a minute. Debacle really <laughs> are saying they did not understand the difference. So let's uh, let's talk about Crowd Street in a sec. Mm -hmm. I don't want to dive into that a little bit. Obviously, it's a you know the biggest platform, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yes, before we yes. get there, um, so which do you prefer? Uh, again, as a prolific investor and uh, you know um, experts in this field, those platforms that do provide some measure of due diligence and who do charge uh you know on a, on a yearly basis right somebody who mm -hmm. you are, are giving you the impression that you can rely on their due diligence or do you prefer platforms that say what what is it well i forget the latin uh the buyer beware what is it yes you know? yes um carpe diem Cop no yeah. that's seize yeah. the day <laughs> yeah. all right duh. we'll get it in a second that's we'll a wrong one. Us, uh i'll have to look i'll look at it while we're talking embarrassing neither of us know it no, it's pretty sad yeah. up the top anyway okay. but, but um so which you prefer that platform that provides that due diligence that mm -hmm. kind of makes the effort or one that just says here here's a marketplace sponsor here's here's a here's a sponsor they put it out themselves we have no responsibility it's just an open market have at it well technically even those ones that charge a fee will still tell you it's your own responsibility and ultimately we are not responsible so unfortunately there really is no true platform that will come out there and say hey yeah we checked this out and it's okay because they're not going to stick out their necks that far so you know for me i i'm not a fan of the ones where they are intermediaries like that just because it's almost like an extra fee that has to be paid and i still am not getting that guarantee that you know they've done the due diligence and honestly even if they said they did, I still have to check them out anyway. So, um, so, and so personally, I actually prefer the ones where it's just very obvious and it's just, it's out there and it's up to, up to yourself to figure it out. Right. So for everybody who are chomping at the bit that we couldn't remember, buy a bit like caveat emptor. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Eureka. You. We'll both be able Eureka. to speak tonight. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Crowd Street. What, what, why don't you describe what happened there? We both know well, but why don't you, in your own words, what happened with Crowd Street? And uh, yeah, just talk about that. So they, 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 they had a sponsor on their, their platform called Nightingale. And the sponsor had done, I want to say, one or two deals before this all happened on the, on the Crowd uh, Street platform had been successful. Then they raised money on this Miami deal, which was like a Miami office property. And then they raised another one, which was, uh, I think it was maybe New York or basically both office deals. And um, it then came out that there was fraud, a lot of fraud, um, many, many millions of dollars of fraud. Mm -hmm. The sponsor, so on at least the second deal, the sponsor never purchased the property and took the money. I'll, I'll say allegedly, allegedly took the money and um, absconded with it, took it and allegedly put it into a whole bunch of other LLCs that either they controlled or that definitely were not controlled by the investors. Um, and so, and on that, I want to say on that Miami deal, I believe it was, it was the same, either that or basically there was some, uh, you know, alleged absconding of the money it may not have been the entire amount, but, mm. but, but basically between this, so it was a, a big black eye for Crowd Street, especially for these investors who were under the false understanding that their money was protected because what Crowd Street did was they did not actually check. Like basically, you would think that they would put the money in escrow. You would think they would gather all this money, put it into escrow, 
And then once the, the purchase is ready to go, release it to the sponsor. But that's not what they did. They basically said, as soon as we get $1 million in, let's send it to the sponsor. And then the sponsor said, great, I'm going to stick that into this bank account. And here's another $2 million. Oh, awesome. I'm going to send it to this bank account. And um, so there was a disconnect between what CrowdStreet was doing and, and, and you know, probably within the law, they were allowed to, to do what they, what they did versus what investors believed that they were doing and the protections that they believed was there. So what is the impact that on on uh, real estate crowdfunding, do you think, of this? Uh, I'm going to use the word, well, whatever, of this uh, situation. Situation, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, well, you know what? You would think that something like this would make people very, very hesitant to you know invest their money. But I look at the the MG Capital one, which is the other fraud we were talking about, which was in a way similar, also many, many millions of dollars that were just fraudulently misappropriated. And that didn't stop anybody from investing. So, um, you know, I, I, I think CrowdStreet does, because of that disconnect, I think CrowdStreet does take a, a black eye on, on this. But I think in the end, you know, people are going to, tr- they have money that they need to deploy. And I think a bigger influence is less of that reputation and more of the fact that, hey, an investor can go out right now and get 5.25% interest by just putting their money in a treasury bond. So it's like, why do I even bother with this you know, 7% or whatever it is with real estate and taking all that risk? Mm-hmm. I think, honestly, really, that is more of a, a threat to you know the, the crowdfunding platforms and real estate in general um, than the reputation. Because I think if once, you know, and hopefully we won't be in a high interest rate environment forever and hopefully not in high inflation, once it hopefully comes down, I think that dynamic changes. We'll see more real estate deals. And then, you know, you know, I, I'll remember the bad things, but I think that a lot of people won't, sadly. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, so it's really as the, uh, so you, so actually just continue this line of thought. So the mm-hmm. impact on the crowdfunding industry, again, this mm-hmm. is something yes, you're yes. quite expert on. Uh, do you th- are, you, are you seeing investors hesitant to invest at the moment? Do you think they're going to come back? Like what? What yes. are what are investors? What, what's investor sentiment from your perspective? Yes. So they're hesitant because they see, oh, all these office deals look terrible. Uh, maybe I'm even in some of them, and they're doing terrible. Um, they're seeing even the multifamily deals calling capital, and they don't like that. So they're very, very hesitant. And they're many of them are like, look, I'm only going to go into like high, high, high quality deals where I feel really, really good about this. Mm-hmm. They're being very, very picky, and then they're comparing that with like, look, I, I can make five point something percent in my treasuries. Like, why am I? You get it's like I want to see a really, really strong argument for me to take my money out of that and put it into real estate. So. A lot of the money that was just flowing into these real estate funds, even like a year and a half ago, is not there anymore. And people are really taking a hard look at things. How do you think it's going to evolve, uh, Ian? Let's say, uh, so we're here October 23 Mm -hmm. uh, through 24 and into 25. Yeah. So, I mean, my hope is that inflation is uh, gets under control you know it's definitely not as bad as it was but it's not also down to where it needs to be it's not down to two percent so you know hopefully it gets into control in 2024 rates start to go back down then at that point these deals start to become more compelling um the the other they just there's only a, a there's a limit on how much they can make and uh an upper limit without doing things like taking on more risk with you know, more leverage and things like that, which I personally don't want to see. So for the conservative investors, you know, I think right now it's like, it's a waiting game, really watching inflation, watching what the Federal Reserve does and watching uh, interest rates. In some ways, no one expected it to be this good at this point, you know, maybe like a year ago, you know, everyone was really concerned we'd be in a recession at this point. So we can be grateful for that. But also I think no one was really expecting that, wow, this actually, we could be stuck in this kind of area. We thought it would be very temporary. We might be here for a long time. So in this environment, you know, it's difficult to find really good deals that are compelling. So what are you investing in today? Again, uh, I know you like to talk about this. I'm very, I'm, I'm very private about that kind of stuff. I know you're happy to talk about it. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so, so what are you, how are you uh, managing your portfolio in yes. this, uh, in this environment? Again, with the caveat that every investor is different, you know, this is just what I personally do. Everyone needs to consult with their own, you know, personal advisors, because who knows, my thing could just fall off a cliff tomorrow. Mm. Um, Having, having said that, you know, I, I'm sticking with my strategy. So I believe in a vintage year strategy, which is the idea that like, you know, it's so hard to predict, you know, this was going to be the good year and this was going to be the bad year. I mean, even for the last, I'd say last 10 years, everyone's saying, oh, this is going to be the bad year. You got to stop investing in real estate. And it, it didn't happen. 
So now we are in tough times. And a lot of times that transition right after it turns from tough to good, some of the really best deals can come out. So, you know, I am hesitant to just go, oh, I'm not going to invest at all. And so I, I've just come with a strategy of so much of like dollar cost averaging in the stock market. I use the vintage year strategy where I'm just like, you know, every year I'm just, I'm not going to put everything into one year. Every year I'm just going to put more in. Every year I put more in. And so I spread it out over time. And that way one bad year is not going to kill me. But hopefully I'm also participating in the really good years. So I am continuing to invest, but only in like, what I consider to be, you know, the, the best of the best, which is like, you know, like I said, really low leverage sponsors that have been around for multiple cycles, which is hard. There's actually not a lot. So um, there are going to be a lot more of them in the next few years. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're right. The ones that survive will be able to say it. So that's yes. really good. Yeah. That's really important, isn't it, actually? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Those that survive it today mm -hmm. will be the ones that you will want to invest in next time so so yes. what advice would you give to a sponsor today even if they look like they are going to lose a deal mm -hmm. uh to uh sponsors that are struggling today that want to survive into the next upturn what kind of advice would you give them what would you yeah well you know they, they may not care about my advice but uh you know but from the point of view of just of an investor you know I, and again me as a conservative investor maybe i'm i'm biased or whatever but i'm like hey the sponsors I'm investing in, I want them to survive and I want them to do well so they can continue to do, you know, invest. And it's like, I, I don't want to see the, it's hard to resist for some, but it's like, I don't want to see the crazy leverage and the, the super high IRRs. And, and I, you know, I, I don't want to see the floating rate debt that allows to also project higher IRRs. I want to see it played conservatively and, you know, maybe not as exciting, but that to me tells me, hey, you're going to be around hopefully for a long time, which is what I want. Ian Ippolito, it is always such a pleasure. And today, this is the first time we've actually met. I've only I ever know. seen your photograph before. <laughs> oh, so it's great. nice to see you in person. You, yeah. you, I must say, you, uh, you look exactly like you sound. Ha, huh, good. <laughs> I think it's good. I don't know. Like <laughs> I expected. Uh, oh, say. great. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. My pleasure. All right, that was Ian Ippolito investor and expert in real estate crowdfunding particularly in the platforms ian it's always a pleasure to talk to you and particularly today to actually quote unquote meet you uh, on a zoom call i don't think we've ever actually met face to face before it was a real pleasure to do that and as always your insights are really interesting and i appreciate you having shared with them uh, uh, shared them with us today on the show if you want to know more about ian go to the Go to gowcrowd.com, go to the podcast page. And while you're there, of course, do please be sure to subscribe to the Gow Crowd newsletter. It comes out once a week. And we cover the major events in commercial real estate syndication from the prior week with implications and act action points that you can actually uh, use. Oh, and of course, thank you, dear viewers, for joining us today. I hope you found the conversation with Ian as interesting as I did. And I look forward to seeing you next time on the Real Estate Reality Show. But for now, this is Adam Gower signing off.